But now, I'm very excited because it is my great, great pleasure to um, introduce Gulsan Onai. Um, she is, let's just face it, phenomenal. I'm going to embarrass you now, phenomenal. Um, from the age of six, she first performed on Turkish radio. She graduated from the Paris Conservatoire at the age of 16. Those two are amazing leaps already in, in a lifetime. She has recorded in, and performed in 68 different countries across all continents. Um, she, in 2003, became a goodwill ambassador for UNICEF. She is a state um, artist and also the solo pianist for um, the Presidential Symphony in um, Ankara. And in 2007, she was awarded with a medal from Poland for being an exceptional interpreter of Chopin. It is my absolute great pleasure to invite you to the stage. Thank you, Gleason Anna. Thank you. It's also my pleasure. Thank you very much to be here with all of you. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, have two uh, parts. So in the first part, it will be about Paris, my years in Paris. So as uh, some of you will know, I mean, I uh, started life as a musician rather early. And um, I first learned the piano before I could read and write and gave my first uh, public concert when I was only six. So I was very fortunate that I found learning and playing very easy. And for the next few years in Istanbul and Ankara, uh, where I had the best teachers in Turkey, um, I progressed very rapidly. Then at the age of 10, I, I was awarded a government scholarship to go to study in Paris. And uh, at that point, my life changed completely. It is hard to imagine what it, is, uh, what it was like for someone brought up as a child in Istanbul, uh, in the 60s and uh, to go to Paris at my age. This was the Paris that we know from films, atmospheric and romantic. Of course, it was also the time of the left-wing protests and uh, ending up with the, the students' riots in, uh, of 68. Uh, for me, Paris was a tiny apartment at six flights of stairs where I lived when I was not studying. That meant going to the conservatoire and um, an old and dusty building in the Rue Madrid. It seemed to be full of the ghosts of French music uh, from Couperin and Rameau and uh, onwards. The teachers were large than life, and uh, among them were some of the most famous figure, figures in French music. I arrived just after the death of the great composer, um, uh, no, of, of the, of the grand dame of fr French pianism, Marguerite Long, and who had been friends of the great composers Debussy and Ravel. Uh, my main teacher, Pierre Sancan, was very severe and old-fashioned, and uh, he only took boys in his class, and, but made a special exception for me. <laughs> and um, he told me all about technique, very little about life. My other piano teacher, Monique Haas, was a true French aristocratic lady, all grace and elegance. And um, I learned theory and composition from the great Nadia Boulanger, who has taught a huge um, a range of famous musicians and composers from uh, Bort Bacharach or Philip Glass. Between my lessons, I would sit in the cafe at the corner of the street to study my scores the same coffee, coffee where Debussy uh, used to sit to take his tea over 100 years ago. So as a young girl uh, out of 60s Turkey, this was an extraordinary cosmopolitan experience and a huge challenge. 
But also there were musical challenges. And one thing I decided to do, even at that stage, was to take advantage of this situation to immerse myself in the French musical heritage. Of course, I knew already a lot about French piano music, about Fauré, Debussy, and Ravel. My teachers, particularly Adnan Saigon, who I'll say some more about later, had studied in France. But this was something different entirely. I was breathing the same air these great composers had, and uh, seeing the same sights, as well as learning new works, I began to understand the uh, ones already uh, knew much uh, better. As my ears and way of thinking musically, because more francophone, I wanted to take things to another level. I decided to learn Ravel's Gaspard de la Nuit. Which is, which is one of the, which is one of the pinnaches of 20th century piano music. Excuse my English pronunciation, it's not very good. Uh, so I'm francophone, francophone, c'est mieux de parler en français, mais malheureusement. <laughs> A wild fusion of French impressionism and 19th century virtuoso romanticism. The other thing is, you know, when it's written, you always read it in French when <laughs> it's always it's the same writing with a totally different pronunciation, <laughs> like virtuose and virtuoso or romantic and romantic. And uh, it is often said to be one of the most difficult pieces in the piano repertoire. It was certainly for me in my early teens the most challenging piece I had ever learned, both technically and musically. <clears throat> it has three parts inspired by a poem by the French poet Aloysius Bertrand, and it's too long to play for you now. Uh, the, so I, I'm just going to play the first part. Uh, this is called Ondin, and it's the story of a magical water goddess who tries to uh, infatuate men who pass the, uh, with her special song. Like the legendary Lorelei of the Rhine or the Sirens of mythology. It is beautiful work and has a special place for me because I played it a few years later at the famous French piano competition of Marguerite Long, Jacques Thibault, and for that I received a special Ravel Prize. So only in first. <laughs>
Now is the part with Saigon, Saigon Adnan Saigon. So only too soon did I discover that I had graduated from the conservatoire and sadly had to leave Paris and return to Turkey. I also went back to my old teacher, Adnan Saigon. Many of you will know about Saigon. It was he who Atatürk entrusted with the job of developing a tradition of European classical music in Turkey. He also studied in, in Paris back in the 20s and uh, I took my first lessons from him when I was very young before I went to France uh, but I carried on learning from him for many years to come. He taught my, me uh, many great things about music, performance, and life itself. One thing I can never forget is how he described the relative roles of composer and performer. The composer, he explained, was like an architect and his score is like the architect's drawings of a building, complete and detailed. And <clears throat> The performer is the builder who has to turn those plans into something real to be used and lived in. It's no good for the performer to get ideas to change the desi design of the building. He should follow the plans to the letter. Saigon had no time for the 19th century idea of the showman performer. For him, the performance needs to show humility to the music he is interpreting and only then can the performance succeed. Another lesson of his was the control of emotions. Music has to be more than just sentimentality. Emotions have to be there but they must be controlled and be part of a vision of the music as a whole. At first, I found this a difficult lesson to follow because for me, like for many people, music has always been about 
emotions. But I, I eventually realized that emotional playing is meaningless if it is not part of an organized interpretation, especially in playing long pieces. A third lesson Saigon told me and lived myself um, was that one's work is never done. Even at the very end of his life, he, ha he was composing right up until he couldn't hold the pen and longer. This made an enormous impression on me. Perhaps the biggest challenge I faced, though, was when he wrote his second piano concerto. I had, of course, played a lot of his music, not under any pressure from him at all, but I really wanted to bring it to the world, particularly his last, uh, first concerto, which many of you, uh, you will have heard, and which I have played in over 40 countries. The concerto was quite an early work, written before I was born. I said to him that I would be thrilled and honored if he, could, if he, would, uh, if he would write another concerto for me to play, and he did. Now, it is not easy for any composer who is dedicated to artistic excellence to write a large-scale piece to a schedule. In the end, and this has happened to many, many great composers through history, the composition was delayed and I received the complete score only a couple of weeks before the first performance. As well, the work was in a different, much darker uh, style with an extremely difficult piano part. Had it been another composer, I might well have postponed the concert. But I had so much respect for Saigon's art as well as a huge debt to him for all the help he had given to me that I worked night and day to prepare and the concert in Izmir with Gurarakal, uh, with Gurarakal conducting was a huge success. We went on to perform it in Germany shortly afterwards and I have played it often since and recorded in, uh, twice, it twice. After playing it, I always have to play several encores and always choose something by Saigon to play. So I will finish by playing for you now two short preludes, which I played in front of Saigon many times and always bring back to me memories of working with such a great man. <laughs> 